This will be a pretty quick talk on the medical disorders of the liver. Uh, there's not really a whole lot of difference in the management of most of these diseases. Uh, the primary difference is going to be on how they're diagnosed. Um, all of these diseases are going to cause cirrhosis. And here we're also going to just focus on medical disorders of the liver. There is a whole set of disorders that are surgical in nature, but that's a completely different topic. So uh, these are all disorders that cause cirrhosis. So what does the liver do? Let's briefly brush up on that. So first off, it detoxifies. So it metabolizes nitrogenous wastes, generally from proteins and it also deactivates some pharmacologic agents. The liver also produces albumin, which is the most abundant protein in the serum, and it's very important for maintaining oncotic pressure, which uh, plays an important role in uh, keeping off edema. It produces coagulation factors 2, 5, 7, and 10, uh, and then it's a major hub of venous traffic between the lower body and the right atrium. So most uh, all venous blood is going to have to go through the liver uh, to get back into the uh, right atrium uh, to go into the lungs. And we call this the portal tract. And this is going to be important when we talk about portal hypertension. So what is cirrhosis? Cirrhosis is just a pathologic state of the liver. Cirrhosis is a pathological diagnosis. So it is not a symptom, it is a diagnosis. And it's caused by chronic inflammation. Again, again that's pathology. So the pathologic changes are really what define cirrhosis, but there are certain symptoms that come out of cirrhosis that we can use as medical uh, criteria that help us know that cirrhosis is indeed present. But cirrhosis is a pathologic diagnosis. So when cirrhosis comes about, it interferes with the ability of the liver to function properly, and it interferes with the ability of blood to properly move through the portal tract. If the liver is cirrhosed, the blood vessels are going to become blocked off, and so it's going to be much more difficult for blood to come back through the liver and into the, into the heart. The number one cause in the United States of cirrhosis is alcoholism, and that is pretty understandable given the abundant, uh, abundancy of alcoholism in this country. Um, but there are a lot of acquired diseases uh, that, and inherited diseases that can also cause cirrhosis. But the number one cause is alcoholism. Cirrhosis is irreversible and incurable. It's a, a fibrotic inflammation, uh, chronic inflammation. So there's really no way you can, you can reverse it. But we can alleviate or reduce some of the symptoms. And cirrhosis always is going to increase the risk of hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the quote-unquote liver cancer. Any chronic inflammation is going to make you more apt for cancer in that organ. We see it in the esophagus with Barrett's esophagus. We see it in the stomach. You see it in the kidneys uh, and so forth. Okay, so what's the pathophysiology of cirrhosis? So what happens when your liver becomes cirrhotic? Well, first off, you are going to uh, reduce your production of albumin. Since your liver can't, is cirrhotic, you're going to, your albumin production is going to decrease. Albumin, remember, is responsible for maintaining oncotic pressure. So when the oncotic pressure drops, fluid is going to move out into the uh, interstitial space. And that's going to be edema and ascites. Ascites is fluid in the peritoneum. Edema is just fluid in, in the general tissue. Uh, this happens uh, because when, when fluid moves out, uh, well, actually, I'll get to that later. Um, so uh, one thing that we have to worry about with ascites is the possibility of uh, developing spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, uh, which we will uh, we'll talk about at length in a little bit. So the treatment for um, the edema and ascites to actually reduce the edema 
is spironolactone. Now, why would you give spironolactone? Why would you just take off the fluid? Well, what happens when, when the albumin production drops off is that you're getting third spacing of fluid. So when the fluid moves into the peritoneum or into the interstitial space, you're getting a, essentially a, a volume depletion because vo fluid is moving out of the vessels. And so what, what does the kidneys do in response to that? It, it perceives that as a low volume state. It perceives that as hypovolemia. And so it's going to release aldosterone and that's going to perpetuate a cycle that's going to cause uh, a higher blood pressure. It's going to cause hypernatremia and so forth. And so we would prefer to cut that cycle. And so we treat this then with spironolactone, which is an aldosterone antagonist. Sponta spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is diagnosed on paracentesis. And this is something that you should suspect anytime a patient comes in with ascites and they have a fever or ascites with pain. And uh, we'll talk about exactly how we diagnose that. That's treated with ceftriaxone or any third generation cephalosporin. So the factors two, five, seven, and 10 are produced in the liver. When the liver becomes cirrhotic, the production of those factors drops off. And so that can cause bleeding uh, as far as it causes an increased protein. The treatment for this, if the bleeding is bad enough, you can transfuse fresh, fresh frozen plasma. Uh, detoxification, we have, uh, there's two things that get detoxified. Uh, nitrogenous wastes, which move out of the body in the form of urea and, uh, and drugs. So as far as drug metabolism, we're going to avoid using drugs that are, hepatic, or that are metabolized in the liver. As far as uh, the, um, the nitrogenous waste, that can cause hepatic encephalopathy, which is the increase in uh, ammonium, and that's directly toxic to the brain. Asterixis is a symptom. It's the hand flapping. Uh, that's a, a classic symptom of uh, increased ammonia. This is treated with lactulose. Lactulose will uh, block the uh, the absorption of of ammonia in the or in the uh, GI tract. Okay, so portal hypertension is really where we're going to get most of the symptoms in cirrhosis. So, what we have here is we've got the veins coming from. So this is venous circulation. We've got a vein coming here, the splenic vein. And then we've got veins that are draining the, uh, the lower GI circulation. So we got the superior mesenteric vein and the inferior mesenteric vein. The inferior mesenteric vein drains into the splenic vein and the superior mesenteric vein drains into the confluence uh, of the IMV and splenic vein. And together that forms the hepatic vein, which then goes through the liver and forms venules uh, into the microcirculation of the liver, and that comes back together, uh, forming the portal vein, which comes up. Now, when the liver becomes cirrhosed, you get a backup of blood, and the pressure in the, the lower part here, the splenic vein, SMV, IMV, uh, and, and the uh, hepatic vein are all going to become, uh, uh, the, the pressure is going to be increased. And so this is what causes the elevated pressure, the elevated portal pressure, the portal hypertension, which causes the lower extremity edema, which causes the ascites, which causes the splenomegaly. It's just hypertension of the veins due to backup in the liver. And so splenomegaly can result in thrombocytopenia. When the spleen gets bigger, it's going to sequester platelets. So we can get thrombocytopenia from that. Hemorrhoids and spider angiomata and varices are all caused essentially for the same reason because those are all veins that, uh, they're accessory veins that will, uh, well, um, varices will be accessory veins around the esophagus, but uh, hemorrhoids and spider angiomata are just a dilation of the veins uh, that uh, become dilated due to the increased portal pressure. So hemorrhoids, spider angiomata, and varices are all uh, sort of symptoms of the same portal hypertension. 
The treatment for hemorrhoids is banding. We're not going to talk about that at length here. Spider angiomata is just a visual symptom uh, of the portal hypertension. Varices, we talk about in the uh, GI bleeding section. The treatment for that is octreotide. Uh, if that's not sufficient, we can do endoscopic banding. If that's not, uh, if that's not sufficient, we can do uh, TIPS, and all these patients who have varices should be on beta blockers. Okay, so this is ascites. These are two patients that both have ascites. You can tell that they have ascites because, well, in this patient, you can see that the veins are clearly engorged here. Another way to, uh, to determine that this is ascites, I, I mean, just looking at it, uh, is that you've got uh, the umbilicus here is a little bit uh, protruding. So that's kind of another way. And then this guy's got uh, a tube and has got, that kind of tells you another uh, hint. But um, you would mostly determine that this is ascites on physical exam, but these are both very, very clear examples. So when we, when a, when a patient has ascites, we want to know where it comes from. There's two different ways you can get ascites. You can get ascites from portal hypertension, which is what we've been talking about. But you can also get ascites from things like cancer and things like infections and things like tuberculosis. And so the way you can think about this is an exudate versus a transudate. It's an effusion. Just like you can get a pleural effusion, those can be caused from two different things. This is, you can think of as a peritoneal effusion. So the way we determine what's causing the ascites is based on the difference of the albumin concentration in the serum from the albumin concentration in the acidic fluid. Albumin concentration in serum minus albumin concentration in acidic fluid. And so this is the serum albumin ascites gradient, and it helps us determine what is causing the ascites, or at least uh, what class of, of causes is causing the ascites. So for high portal pressure, this is going to be a high serum albumin ascites gradient. So what would cause it to be high? Well, you'd either have to have a high concentration of albumin in the serum or a low concentration of albumin in the acidic fluid. And it's actually a low concentration of albumin in the acidic fluid because we know that there's not a very high amount of albumin in the serum because the ascites is being caused by low albumin. So why is, uh, why is this a high serum albumin ascites gradient? When you have high portal pressure, what happens is you have hydrostatic pressure that pushes fluid out of the veins. So what results from that is that you get fluid only in the, the peritoneal uh, space, in the acidic fluid. You don't have proteins in with it. It's just fluid. It's just uh, serum. So only fluid comes out of the vein into the peritoneal space, and you don't have albumin, not in a very high concentration, in the ascites. So the albumin in the ascites is going to be very, very, very low. The albumin in the serum will be low, but it won't be super low. So the result of this is that it's going to be quote unquote high. It'll be greater than 1.1. Now let's compare this to a transudation or the other kind of ascites, which can be caused by many different things, cancers, tuberculosis, infections, what happens in this case is that the, the veins become more leaky. And when the veins become more leaky, albumin can come out with the fluid. When, because albumin can come out with the fluid into the ascites, the albumin in the acidic fluid is going to be a little bit higher. And the result of that is the serum albumin ascites gradient is going to be lower. So, uh, like I said, there's unique causes for this. There's a lots of different causes. So knowing that there's a, uh, a low, this should be uh, less than 1.1. Uh, uh, but just knowing that the, the, uh, that the serum albumin ascites gradient is less than 1.1 does not tell you what it, the exact cause is. It just tells you that this is a transudate and it's not due to high portal pressure. So a low serum albumin ascites gradient, less than 1.1, um, or less than 1.0 will tell you that this is a transudative 
serum albumin ascites gradient. It's not due to high, high portal pressure. And this is going to be very important to know because when a patient presents, sometimes they may just have ascites. And you want to know, is this caused from a high portal pressure? Is this patient in a, cer a cirrhotic state? Or is there a, another uh, malignant cause or an infectious cause behind it? Most of the time, it's going to be due to a high portal pressure, but you want to know this equation so that you can differentiate between the two. Again, high portal pressure is a hydrostatic pressure, and that's going to push only fluid out. With, with TB and cancer and infections, it's going to cause the veins to become more leaky, and that's going to cause fluid and albumin to become in the acidic fluid. Since the albumin is in the acidic fluid, it's going to cause the SAAG to be lower, less than 1.1 or 1.0. So as far as ascites, all patients who present with ascites should have a periocentesis, and that's to sample the acidic fluid and to obtain the serum albumin ascites gradient. Now, if a patient has ascites and they also have pain or fever or any kind of symptom that may look like an infection, low blood pressure, tachycardia, then you definitely are going to need to uh, take a close examination at this acidic fluid because spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is a potentially lethal complication of ascites. So the index of suspicion should always be very high in any patient that has ascites with any symptom of infection, uh, especially fever and abdominal pain. So we don't culture the, uh, the acidic fluid. You can culture it, but that's not going to be what you use for your diagnosis. The best step is peritonitis with, or sorry, periocentesis with a white blood cell analysis. Culture takes too long, and this is something that can be deadly very fast. So what you do is you get your periocentesis, you put some of that underneath the slide, well the, the lab will do it, you won't be doing it, uh, and if there are greater than 500 white blood cells, then this would be considered bacterial peritonitis. And the treatment here is going to be ICU admission with the third generation cephalosporin. So ceftriaxone or cefotaxime are, are fine. You can also transfuse the patient with albumin to reduce the, uh, to reduce the flow of, of fluid uh, into the peritoneal space. And then you're going to repeat the periocentesis to make sure that you've, uh, you've cleared the acidic fluid of, uh, of infection. Uh, you, you generally won't be able to culture bacteria out of the acidic fluid just because the bacteria are, uh, are not in a high concentration, but you will be able to see white blood cells if there's inflammation, and that's going to, the absence of white blood cells will be what tells you that, that you've cured the, the uh, bacterial peritonitis. Generally, this will take about 10 to 14 days of IV antibiotics. Okay, so these are the different causes of cirrhosis. Uh, alcoholic cirrhosis, we're really not going to talk about because it's just general cirrhosis with no other symptoms. It is, though, the most common, so you should be aware that all those symptoms we talked about uh, in cirrhosis, uh, the bleeding, the portal hypertension, and so forth, are all going to be present in the alcoholic cirrhosis. Chronic hepatitis is an infectious cause. Primary sclerosing cholangitis, primary biliary cirrhosis, hemochromatosis, alpha-1, antitrypsin deficiency, and Wilson's disease are going to be what we're going to talk about. There's the complications from any kind of cirrhosis, and those include most prominently hepatocellular carcinoma, which is the liver cancer, and hepatorenal syndrome, which is an idiopathic renal failure that accompanies chronic liver disease. So chronic hepatitis is an infectious disease, and this is a virus, and it's a virus that attacks the hepatocytes directly. This is going to result in acute inflammation, which eventually is going to become chronic because this occurs over a long period of time, and uh, this will eventually result in the laying down of, of fibrotic tissue, and so that's cirrhosis. Hepatitis B and C are the hepatoviruses that can cause chronic hepatitis. You can get acute hep B and acute hep C, but you can't get chronic hep A. Hepatitis A is a foodborne illness, 
So uh, that does not cause chronic hepatitis, but hepatitis B and hepatitis C can both cause chronic hepatitis. They don't always cause chronic hepatitis. Sometimes it'll just be acute hepatitis, but they can cause chronic hepatitis. We do have a uh, vaccine for hepatitis B, and all healthcare workers and people in high risk situations should be advised to get this vaccine. Hepatitis C, uh, we do not yet have a vaccine. The associated risk factors for both Hep B and Hep C, because they are bloodborne, uh, include IV drug use. A lot of patients will say that they had tattoos. Um, most tattoo parlors are uh, relatively well regulated, uh, but that's what a lot of patients will tell you. Uh, high risk sexual practices are uh, another relatively common way to contract hepatitis, and needle sticks and work in healthcare is also a risk factor. The symptoms of chronic hepatitis are generally nil. Uh, the patient is usually going to be asymptomatic until the general signs of cirrhosis develop. So this could be difficult to distinguish from alcoholic cirrhosis other than the fact that the patient doesn't have a history of alcoholism, but uh, they may. So uh, you always, when a patient comes in and you realize that they do have uh, cirrhosis based on their, their uh, high uh, liver uh, function tests and their, uh, their symptoms of cirrhosis, uh, then uh, you should definitely get a uh, hepatitis panel. And so you'll get your hepatitis B, uh, antigens and antibodies and your hepatitis C antibodies. Uh, you definitely want to diagnose out oh, chronic hepatitis from alcoholic hepatitis because there's medication we can give for chronic hepatitis which would be effective in, uh, in, in treating some of the symptoms. So any patients with signs of cirrhosis should get hepatitis titers uh, because this is actually relatively common. It's not as common as alcoholic hepatitis, but it is out there. As far as how we determine the diagnosis, we're going to get hep B and hep C titers on all patients. Hep B is diagnosed by the presence of hep B surface antigen. And that should never be present in a patient who's simply gotten vaccinated. Remember, surface antigen is something that's on the actual virus. Patients who have been vaccinated will be, have the antibody, but they won't have the actual antigen itself. Hep C is diagnosed by the presence of anti-Hep C antibodies and a positive viral load. For treatment for chronic hepatitis, everybody should get interferon alpha. And uh, for hepatitis B, we'll give them lamivudine or adefavir in addition. And hepatitis C, we'll give them ribavirin in addition. Okay, primary sclerosing cholangitis is an idiopathic inflammatory disorder of the ductal system. And so this is important to keep in mind that this is not a disease that directly attacks the liver. It attacks the biliary ductal system. And the biliary ductal system is uh, the ducts that transport bile from the liver into the duodenum. And so this is not attacking the liver itself. It is attacking the bile ducts. And what happens from this is that when the bile ducts become inflamed, you get cholestasis. Cholestasis is just sludging and congestion of bile. And the result of that is going to be a pressure increase, a backflow, and that's going to result in inflammatory changes in the hepatocytes. And uh, that's going to result in inflammation and ultimately cirrhosis. So this is indirectly causing inflammation in the hepatocytes. This is associated with inflammatory bowel disease. The USMLE is going to want you to know that association. And the symptoms are going to be rather nonspecific. Again, you got fatigue, but uh, here you'll have pruritus and jaundice. Now, we don't necessarily see that in, in other forms of cirrhosis, but the pruritus and jaundice here are going to be due to the fact that you've got a bilirubin problem. Because of the cholestasis, you're going to get absorption of bilirubin into the blood, and so the bilirubin could be, can be elevated. And when bilirubin collects in the blood, it gets into the skin, and that causes the jaundice or the yellowing of the skin. And then you'll also get pruritus, which is itching, and that's just due to an allergic 
uh, reaction to the uh, to the bilirubin. So pruritus and jaundice in a patient with inflammatory bowel disease definitely think PSC. Malabsorption can be present uh, usually in more advanced disease, and that's because uh, if you're not getting bile into the into the intestines, then you're not going to be able to emulsify your fats, and you're not going to be able to absorb your fats, and so malabsorption may be present. Other cirrhotic symptoms could be present as well, but usually this is going to be something that gets diagnosed a little bit earlier on, uh, a little bit before cirrhosis happens. It's going to be diagnosed when the jaundice and pruritus happen um, because that's something that people notice. That's a visible thing. So when you have a patient that you are suspecting PSC, uh, so for instance, of ulcerative colitis, 45 years old, comes in with jaundice, then what you should do is get your liver function tests. And what's going to be notable here is that you're going to have normal liver enzymes. Why are the liver enzymes normal? Well, because you don't have a disease that attacks the hepatocytes. Your hepatocytes are fine, at least early on in the disease. And so you'll have a normal AST and ALT. Those show hepatocyte function. But what you will have is an elevated alkaline phosphatase. Alkaline phosphatase is, is a marker of biliary ductal function. So when you have an elevated alkaline phosphatase, it means that there's something wrong with the bile ducts. Uh, an elevated GGTP can be present as well. Uh, that's gamma glutamylamyl transphosphatase. Uh, but just keep in mind alkaline phosphatase and uh, GGTP. So we're going to talk about uh, PBC next, but uh, once you get your uh, once you get your labs, these are this is essentially a screen, and you find out that you have an elevated pho uh, alkaline phosphatase. What you're going to go ahead and do then is get an AMA titer. This is going to help you differentiate it from primary biliary cirrhosis, which is uh, another disease that uh, is an inflammatory disorder of the bile ducts, and in primary biliary cirrhosis, that's autoimmune. Primary sclerosing cholangitis is not autoimmune. So when you get your AMA titer, your anti-mitochondrial antibody titer, that's going to be negative because this is not an autoimmune disorder. It is inflammatory, but it is not autoimmune. So this will be negative. AMA will be negative. And the definitive way to diagnose primary sclerosing cholangitis is to directly visualize the bile ducts. And you can do that via ERCP. Uh, so you stick a, an endoscope down the mouth and into the duodenum and, and uh, up through the ampulla, uh, or you can just do a transhepatic cholangiogram. Uh, those will be definitive, so you're actually visualizing the biliary ducts. Once you've diagnosed PSC, the treatment is going to be bile acid binding resins. And the reason that that works for therapy is because it's going to reduce the reabsorption of bile. And that's a good thing because it's going to reduce the symptoms of pruritus and jaundice. Now, uh, and it's also going to reduce the amount of bile in the biliary duct. Liver transplant is the only uh, cure for PSC. And even then... Uh, in most cases, the PSC will recur. Okay, primary biliary sclerosis. This is very similar to primary sclerosing cholangitis, but what's going to set it apart is the kind of patient it happens in and the AMA titer. So primary biliary sclerosis is an autoimmune disorder. It also attacks the biliary ductal system. It also causes inflammation in the, the biliary ducts, and it also causes cholestasis, which also causes inflammatory changes in the hepatocytes eventually due to the biliary sludging and congestion. So the pathophysiology here is somewhat similar. The mechanism is somewhat similar. The difference is that this is due to an autoimmune cause. The mechanism as to why it causes hepatic damage is the exact same. Now this tends to be in middle-aged women who have other autoimmune disorders like Sjogren syndrome, uh, or or uh, or uh, thyroid disease, and so 
that's something to keep in mind. These patients tend to have other autoimmune disorders, Hashimoto's thyroiditis, Addison's disease. The symptoms are going to be virtually the same as in PSC. You're going to get fatigue, pruritus, jaundice. Patients may even be asymptomatic. And it makes sense that the symptoms are going to be the same as PSC because your mechanism of disease is essentially the same. The only thing that's different is the actual ideology. One is just due to an idiopathic inflammation. The other is due to an actual uh, antibody that's causing an autoimmune reaction. Your labs for screening are going to be the same as in PSC. Uh, you'll have normal liver function tests, elevated ELKFAS, and elevated GGTP. Uh, to diagnose this, you're going to get an AMA titer. When that AMA titer comes back positive, that's your diagnosis for PBC. Uh, the definitive way to diagnose PBC, though, is with liver biopsy. We treat this the same way we treat PSC, and that's with bioacid binding resins and uh, liver transplant uh, definitively. So the way you're going to tell PSC and PBC apart is the patient that it happens in. One happens in a patient usually with inflammatory bowel disease. The other tends to happen in middle-aged women with other autoimmune disorders. But the way that we're going to tell this apart, uh, the major way we're going to tell this apart is with an AMA titer. But the definitive diagnosis for PSC is with ERCP or uh, transhepatic cholangiogram. And for PBC, it's with liver biopsy. All right, so now we're going to move on to the inherited diseases that cause cirrhosis. So hemochromatosis is an inherited disorder of iron absorption. And so what happens here is that you have an overavidity of iron absorption in the, uh, in the bowel. And what results in that is that you get a high level of serum iron and iron deposits all over the place. So iron deposits in the liver and it's going to cause inflammation and that's going to cause cirrhosis, but you're gonna have iron depositing in other places that are gonna cause other symptoms. So yes, you do have iron deposits in the liver and that causes cirrhosis, but what's going to point you towards hemochromatosis are the other symptoms that, uh, that, that come from iron depositing in those tissues. So the general symptoms of hemochromatosis are cirrhotic, and then you'll also have symptoms of iron deposition in other tissues. So you could see restrictive cardiomyopathy from iron deposition and inflammation in the heart. You could get arthralgia from iron deposition in joint tissue. You can get hyperpigmentation from deposition in the skin. Iron can deposit in the pancreas and that can cause diabetes. You can get hypogonadism, and that's from deposition in the gonads. So iron deposits all over the place when you have hemochromatosis, and it's important to keep that in mind because there are multiple different symptoms that hemochromatosis can pre present with. But what it will have always is the cirrhotic symptoms. So that will always be present. And so it's going to be really important in these patients, because this is an inherited disorder, to get a family history of cirrhosis, of liver cancer, or any kind of liver problems. Liver cancer is going to be the, the most important one because liver cancer is going to be the one that people will remember. If your uncle or your grandma died of liver cancer, you know that. You don't necessarily know, remember if a family member had cirrhosis or liver problems, but if, if a patient comes in and they are able to tell you on their family history that they had a relative that died of liver cancer, then you know that maybe there are there's hemochromatosis in the family, there's liver disease in the family. So the way we diagnose hemochromatosis is relatively straightforward. It's just iron studies uh, and you'll have a high iron level, not surprisingly, a high ferritin and a low TIBC. This is essentially the opposite of iron deficiency anemia. TIBC, you can think of it uh, as just the, the seats for iron on the blood. So uh, you've got, uh, if you've got high iron levels, then you're gonna have a low TIBC and vice versa. So the TIBC means the capacity to bind more iron. So high iron level, high ferritin, and low TIBC. 
However, the definitive way to diagnose hemochromatosis is a liver biopsy. The treatment is going to be phlebotomy. That's like an ancient therapy, but uh, it does it have a place in modern medicine for hemochromatosis. And all you're doing here is you're draining out blood, which causes a, uh, an iron deficiency. It would cause an iron deficiency in most people, but in patients with hemochromatosis, you're getting rid of excess iron by getting rid of excess, uh, uh, by getting rid of blood. So phlebotomy is the most effective at treating hemochromatosis, but you can also use the iron chelator deferoxamine. There is an increased risk of infection in patients with hemochromatosis, and those organisms are Vibrio vinificus and Yersinia. Those are both notable for causing uh, diarrhea. Wilson's disease is an inherited disorder of copper absorption and secretion. And so copper is a uh, mineral that can also deposit in various tissues. Most notably, it uh, can deposit in the liver, eyes, and brain. So copper is toxic to the liver. That's going to cause inflammation and cirrhosis. So you'll have your general cirrhotic tissues. You will also get copper deposition in the eyes, in the iris. And so when, a, get a, when you get accumulation of copper in the iris, it's going to result in this brownish-green Kaiser Fleischer ring. It's, uh, it's just a green ring around the iris, and I'll show you a picture of that. It's called the Kaiser Fleischer ring, and it's essentially pathognomonic for Wilson's disease. And it'll be most visible on slit lamp examination. The accumulation of copper in the brain also results in various symptoms. Uh, you're going to get accumulation of copper in the basal ganglia. That's going to result in various movement symptoms, choreathiosis, and uh, it can, uh, which is sort of like your flappy dance. Uh, it can result in a Parkinson-like gait, and also it can result in psychosis. So cirrhosis or uh, HCC, uh, hepatocellular carcinoma, with psych symptoms should tip you off. Uh, psych or movement or neurologic symptoms. Uh, sometimes the USMLE will just come right out and tell you the description of a Kaiser Fleischer ring. You should be acutely aware of what that looks like so that when they describe it to you, you know that this is Wilson's disease because it doesn't occur in anything else. Again, because this is an inherited disease, you should be inquiring into the family history if Wilson's disease is something that you've got on your mind. And so a family history, particularly a psychiatric history, and a family history of liver problems or liver cancer. The means of diagnosing this practically are to get a ceruloplasmin level, which is a transporter of copper. So if you have a lot of copper, your ceruloplasmin, your free ceruloplasmin is going to be low. So a low ceruloplasmin and a high serum copper. That's not technically diagnostic of Wilson's disease. The definitive diagnosis will be a liver biopsy, uh, which is most specific. But if it asks you, uh, if it tells you a patient has this brownish green ring around their iris and they've got psychosis uh, and they've got uh, symptoms of cirrhosis, your diagnostic test of choice is going to be to get a ceruloplasmin level. The treatment here is going to be penicillamine, which is a copper chelator. And this is the Kaiser Fleischer ring. So once you see it, you'll never forget it. This is a patient with blue eyes. This is not something that normally occurs on their eyes. This is copper depositing in their iris. Okay, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. This is another inherited deficiency. Uh, or an inherited disorder, and this tends to present in pediatrics. Uh, this is an inherited deficiency of the protein alpha-1 antitrypsin. This is a protein that is responsible for inhibiting a protein degrader. So essentially, you're inhibiting this protein, alpha-1 antitrypsin, inhibits a protease. So if you don't have enough of the protein that inhibits the protease, the protease is going to be overactive. And this specific protease that alpha-1 antitrypsin blocks is a protease that degrades tissue. 
So if you're not blocking a, a protein that's degrading tissue, you're going to get tissue degradation. And this occurs in the liver and the lungs. And so a deficiency of alpha-1 antitrypsin, an alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency will lead to pulmonary symptoms and cirrhosis. So the symptoms usually, these will be children that present with emphysema. Children, teenagers, young adults that present with emphysemic-like symptoms. Emphysema would be like shortness of breath, wheezing, dyspnea, asthma-like symptoms, but they're not responsive to typical asthma therapy. Technically, what differentiates asthma from, uh, from emphysema is the uh, carbon monoxide diffusion capacity. But these will be patients with emphysema without a smoking history. So emphysema at a young age is highly suspicious for alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. And a lot of times the way these patients will present is just the patient that has asthma that never seems to go away. And, uh, and so it's important to uh, get a history on these patients. Uh, again, uh, pulmonary history, liver history, etc. The diagnosis for uh, these patients will be pretty straightforward. It's going to be an alpha-1 antitrypsin titer, which of course is going to be low since this is a deficiency. And the treatment is going to be an enzyme replacement and symptomatic therapy, which will be the bronchodilators, etc., how we treat uh, emphysema. And of course, most importantly, these patients should not be smoking. So this is just a review of the uh, the two acquired causes, the two idiopathic causes, and the three inherited causes of cirrhosis. Most important, what I want to point out real quick here, the difference between PSC and PBC is the kind of patient it happens in and the fact that uh, AS, a PSC, the AMA will be negative, PBC, the AMA will be positive, but we're going to treat these the exact same way. And that is it.